but I'll keep that in mind because I think there could easily be a counterbalance checklist as well because uh, counterbalance will include things like battlegrounds, segmenting, uh, situational techniques. So I think there's room for a checklist probably in every every layer. So I like checklists too. I really like that I am uh, I'm developing the 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 hydrostasy version of the Egong book as a reminder for me. So I really like it. I really like ha and I know that I'm going to love having a little hydrostasy Egong book to remind me uh, to put my mind in certain places, to build on my practice in a certain way, day in and day out. So um, I'm glad that it's it's working well for you, and I can it makes sense. And uh, I'll continue to put checklists and things like that in the Egong books because it's instructional. Um, but it it'll go all the way. You know, uh, warrior training will have a checklist. It would be really nice just to have a checklist for those traps of thinking, and if I listed the traps of thinking, how many of those traps did we get into just yesterday? Comparing and contrasting, trying to figure it out, the tendency to focus on self, my problems, my goals, what I want, things working out for me. And again, it's not that you shouldn't want things for yourself. It's the tendency to think. The habit is, is thought. <clears throat> it's one of the biggest habits in the human experience. And it's not so much that we shouldn't have the things that we want for ourselves, but the tendency is to just think about them. And that's the habit. And that is the closed feedback loop. Yes, Galaxy A42 5G. Shana, if there's more coffee, I would love a refill. It's Donna. I assume so, but <clears throat> you never know, right? Uh, be sure. I like the idea of checklists too, more for um, to to check in, just like early in a basic alignment, uh, check in, where is my mind? Um, and it's really the same thing. It's where in my mind, where's my points of attention? Did I build on them? Sometimes you have to deconstruct it, reconstruct it again quickly, because I can do it relatively quickly now because of practice. Uh, less about what am I not doing, I, I I tend to get discouraged when I overfocus on what I'm not doing. Um, it's just what I tend to do. Uh, but I agree with Ida. It's really helpful. And when she said, when I have to do something that I really don't want to do, and she goes to the checklist, it really helps. And and um, the <laughs> analogy of the bud was was um, resonant for me. But um, I find that if I feel the pull towards trying to muscle through something I don't want to do, then I'm, I need it. That's when I need to check in because then I'm not doing the practice. And when I glance at the checklist and it's a reminder to me, um, then it does, no matter what I'm doing, it's what I want to be. I'm, I'm not even evaluating it in terms of, is this what I want to do or don't want to do it's if I if I really don't want to do it and I'm not going to do it <laughs> and um, if I want to get it done then then doing it mindfully no longer it's no longer an arduous task that I'm trying to get through to accomplish something I've just decided to do this for the reasons that I've decided or even without reason I'm doing this now this is what I'm doing because it's part of my life <laughs> at this moment and I don't eval. It doesn't. The practice lends itself to an appreciation of whatever I'm doing. I, it always comes back to something very simple. I'm going to be standing, sitting, walking, laying down. So um, I am either practicing or I'm not practicing. Whether I'm on a slow boat to China or <laughs> whether I'm cleaning the house, you know. Um, so the, the practice is where the quality is, not necessarily in my evaluation of what I'm doing or not doing. Absolutely. <clears throat> Just thought the word quality when you were talking about that, about quality being in the moment, 
not trying to get somewhere, but using the moment that you're in to have the quality. And you said there the word go. quality. So there. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, hopefully, well, not hopefully, I don't know. You can use whatever words you want to use, but hopefully the word uh, quality resonates because it's such an important part of the practice, especially in hydrostasy. But let's talk about connection because I can connect uh, the word connection and uh, the word quality. I would put the word quality akin to the word uh, that we would commonly use that I don't really use. And you probably won't be surprised, but I don't really use the word love. Not a lot. And the reason is, is because that word means something different for everybody. And it's not that it's not a good word. It's not that I don't have uses for it. I use it in my own mind sometimes in my own um, internal self-talk, especially intentional self-talk. I don't mind the word love because I know what I'm talking about when I use the word to myself. But that's a word like the f bomb. It can mean so many things to so many different people like happiness and love and uh, the F word that it, it really it means nothing until we come to a clear definition of it. But the best way to come to the same definition that I hold for that word is through the word quality, because that's how it's felt. And we can all agree that any time that we want to use the word love in, a, in the most authentic way, there is a sense of quality there. And I say authentic because you know how sometimes it is a bit um, obligatory or it just becomes a, a regular part of our speech, which is okay. You know, it's a gesture and I'm not declaring war on that or anything, but the feeling is is what we're really talking about. So does that make sense so far? And then I can uh, describe what I mean by the word connection. It is an important word, but it might not be the way that other people use the word. I don't know. So I just want to be clear with that word. Otherwise, other words that could stem from it won't won't make much sense. And then we can get into these enemies of knowledge. And then, um, of course, a, do a quick review. What is knowledge? Again, how I use the terminology. Um, just to be very clear with how I use my words to make sure everything stays nice and neat. That's all. Not a declaration on um, concepts or meanings or anything like that, but connection is a really important word for specifically somebody, and you may or may not be able to relate to this um, relation, being able to relate is a type of connection, so it's we could keep going back to that word. But severe social anxiety doesn't actually require social settings. Does that make sense? I don't know if anybody, if you've never really felt that feeling, then you may not understand this idea that you can be in a room by yourself and you're still feeling socially anxious. You could be leaving the house to go get milk and that's it. You're just going to go get milk and come back. And the moment you step outside, you feel socially anxious. Does that make sense? Hopefully you don't know what that feels like, but. Yeah, it does. And it's like, sometimes I, I, I have three local shops that I frequent and sometimes I don't want to go to a particular one because I know I'm going to have to talk to that girl again who's always on the counter. And in the past, I would have thought about that before I went out. You know, and possibly going to see a bank manager when I had a business, I would have thought about the bank manager before I went out and had that anxiety all morning before the meeting even occurred that kind of thing is that what you're talking about that kind of thing yeah very yeah. similar um let's just hope that the lady at the counter and they don't want to watch these videos otherwise they're going to know Ida, that you don't really want to come see him but yes but you know that's uh, a one-to-one -one. you have a specific person in mind the social anxiety that I'm talking about can include that, but it doesn't have to. You actually may not even have a specific person in mind. And that's why I call it the invisible eyes of other people. So people who suffer from severe social anxiety, they can create the social anxiety without any social setting or any specific person in mind. That's when I really started to explore the nature of connection. For example, two people. When does connection actually occur? And this was important for me with my social anxiety thing that I was kind of learning to navigate is when am I actually making a connection or contact with other people? 
So when I'm in a social setting and there's, you know, 500 people, I'm not, I'm not making a, a, a connection to these people, right? A physical connect. There's no connection. I'm not touching them. Nothing is really happening between them and I. So of course, this was a time when I was reasoning it. It we we call it the voice of power now, but logic. You know, I would logically tell myself, well, I'm not even really interacting with anybody right now. No interaction is occurring. It's all inside my own awareness. It's all inside my own mind. Does that make sense? I haven't actually even talked to a person yet. So I was really, I'm giving you the background of where I was really analyzing this dynamic. So when does connection occur with two people? What arrives first? What is the first thing to make a connection to another person? If a connection is made, I don't mean just staring at somebody because then you haven't really made a connection. You're just staring at them. Remember connection implies two points and a pathway between two points. Listening to somebody, sure. What preceded listening to them? Recognition of each other. Okay, now we're getting closer. What is my favorite word that would go along with recognition and would precede being able to listen to them? What's What arrives first? And you can recognize the other, but the other hasn't recognized you necessarily, so no connection has, there hasn't been a connection point. Eye contact. Eye contact would uh, be the beginning of it, yes, but there's something that precedes even eye contact. I'll give you a, another hint. A feeling. A feeling. Um, a feeling would be an interpretation. It would be your mind, body, and energy's interpretation of the events that are occurring, right? Uh, choice uh, is related to what I'm talking about. Oh, judgment. No. Judgment is something that occurs afterwards through thought. Awareness is getting closer. Awareness is another word for uh, like recognition. We have recognized it. So it can be in our field of recognition. But once we place our. Shit, I just gave you the word. It's not peace. <laughs> recognition. Uh, not recognition. Recognition. <laughs> Consciousness, we're getting so close. I don't know. I'm really not sure how we're missing this. Field of perception. Attention. Attention. Thank you. <laughs> wow. We took the long road around there. Let me get a drink of coffee while I let that settle. Attention precedes all of that. Did you say that, Lauren? Where is that? that, that, that. I don't see attention up there. Oh, you did. You said paying attention. There it is at 626 a.m. Lauren got it first. Yeah, she did say that. <laughs> so that's it. Uh, paying attention. That's the way that we talk about it, right? Because we talk about it directionally, giving attention, paying attention, right? I missed it. Sorry. There were a lot of words coming in. <laughs> And maybe the word paying in front of it threw me off. But yes, it is attention. Attention arrives first. So if there's nobody with their camera on, so I have Lisa and Karen F next to me. So if Lisa or Karen F are in the room, we haven't established connection until, at least especially like a mutual connection, until our attentions have met. The lights, the light of our individual attentions cross paths. Does that make sense? That's when the initial interaction between any two people will occur. If you don't have their attention, you're still just talking to yourself. Like you may think that you're talking to Lisa or Karen, but if, if they're not paying attention to you, you don't exist to them. So no connection has occurred. So connection begins with attention itself. It's the only thing that is interacting with your environment directly before your assemblage of cognition or your interpretation of events. Does that make sense? So I see Lisa, haven't quite made connection yet because I don't have her attention. She does have mine because I'm over there looking at her. She looks over at me. You always, maybe not always, it depends on where your mind is, but you can always, you have the opportunity to notice that moment, that moment where two people, their attention has crossed paths. 
And then that's the moment of connection. Everything else after that is post-processing. Does that make sense? Even the recognition of the two people is, is post-processing. Do you know what I mean by post-processing? Does that make sense? Post-processing. That's a psychological way looking at the mind. Yeah, we take in our environment and we process it into a still image almost that we call the moment, the present moment. I don't know why I said it like that, the moment, but I, yeah, the present moment. We want to create a still frame out of that. That's where connection begins. And I really love, <laughs> ironically, I'll use that word, the definition that Lauren gave once upon a time that the word love is connection without judgment. So that means that we have made our connection. If I'm if I'm making connection to an inanimate object, well, then obviously it doesn't have attention. So it's just one way. So if I want to connect to my cup, I just got to look at it and give it my attention. If I want to make a connection between two people, however, that requires mutual attention shining towards one another. And then there's a, a point where the two attentions in a manner of speaking, are meeting. That's the connection point. Does that make sense? You can feel that connection point when you really pay attention to it. When you when you notice that somebody is noticing you, when attention has uh, crossed streams or crossed other fields of attention, you can feel it intuitively. So at least empirically, we can all agree on the evidence of that, that all of us have experienced that connection. The moment you start to think about it, that's not it. We've gone away from that word, that definition that Lauren gave of love. Now, uh, people and animals, I would agree. Uh, for the most part, uh, most animals, they make that attention connection. Uh, I can't think of an animal I haven't made that connection. So maybe all animals, yeah. And that's another principle, kind of would be a longer conversation, but attention, awareness itself doesn't age. It doesn't feel to be changing or moving because it is shared. It is the closest thing to I am or God that we can really get to is attention itself and the pristine nature of consciousness without all of the post-processing. Nothing wrong with post-processing, but what the human being tends to do is focus on that. And then they start to think about that. And then now we're thinking about post-processing rather than meeting the action point where it exists, which is happening right now. So connection would mean that two fields of attention have crossed paths. And have you ever had a really comfortable silence with somebody, but you know that you're sharing attention? Yeah. That's the quality. And then so that quality, I prefer the word quality over the word love, but it's a similar word uh, because now what we're talking about is a feeling that is post-processing. The feeling that you feel from the act of attention or the direction of attention is post-processing because you're perceiving it. It's a part of that, that image that is being created of the present moment. All of your emotions are inside that image. It's post-processing. Does that make sense? It makes such sense. And I never realized the words associated with the feeling, although I think we've all had the feeling. But when there is a connection without thought and the correct and the and the attention is mutual and maintained without a, lo a lot of thought introduced, it's it's the highest quality of attention. That you can feel there's so much appreciation in that because it's timeless and it's um, it, um, I I don't want to say pure and sound cliche, but it's pure connection because it's not interfered with by thought streams. Yes, bingo. And then uh, where do thought streams come from? You know, they're going to come from habit. They're going to come from our beliefs. They're going to come before you know it. When a person is evaluating someone else, it is really just a reflection of their own cognition. It's a reflection of their own mind at a certain point. Right. You can you can um, you can hustle yourself into thinking that this is 
connection is still being maintained, but it's really a relationship you're having with the other person in your own head doesn't necessarily really right. exist because you have a lot of right. opinions and thought streams about it that come from a, a, a whole bunch of other places that have nothing to do with the other person or that moment. Right. And so if you remove the other person and you want to make connection to the sunset, you want to make connection to the river, you want to make connection to the parking lot. I love parking lots. You'd be surprised. You can make a connection to anything. The connection is your raw attention. That's where the connection occurs. The connection point is in the moment, the direction of your attention. When it's on something, it's being cast onto something. That's where the artist's edge comes from, is that quality that comes from attention when there's not a lot of judgment. Now, the way that we normally use the word is, uh, I won't use myself, let's just say two people, <laughs> but one person makes a connection via attention with another person, and then all of the cognition. Maybe she likes me. Maybe I can woo her into a complex human mating ritual, and now biology and entertainment, and now we're going to exchange personal histories, and you like, uh, I don't know, bubble gum and skateboarding? Me too. And now they have a cognitive match point, and then before you know it, they're dating, and uh, they're getting emotional derivative, and they're calling that in love. What a hustle. Now, these are good emotions, don't get me wrong, but we have one blanket word for all of these different things occurring, and I find that to be wildly erroneous. But the Matrix does a great job of breaking down love because there's a computer program talking to Neo, and he says that he loves his daughter. And, of course, Neo is like, you're a computer. How can you love anything? And then, of course, he says that love is just a word. It's a word to describe a feeling. The feeling is emotional for human beings, and it must be something else for the machines and the matrix. But does that make sense? So when we talk about connection, when I talk about connection, I'm not talking about post-processing. I'm not talking about the emotional derivative. I'm not even talking about how it feels. Do you see how it feels is post-processing? Attention arrives first. It is our most direct way of interacting with the universe. I want to I want to emphasize that before we go on that it, it's such an important point so important like it, one of the most important things I could possibly say is that our most direct way of interacting with the universe let's make it less the interacting with your environment your direct environment is with attention itself the direction casting placing the direction of your attention it starts with the desire and intention. And then that intention is what's moving your attention. So one of the biggest goals that we have in this system is to bring intention and attention and have them overlap eventually to where there's no discernible difference. That will equal what, what Donna was talking about, get shit done that we don't really want to do. And sometimes we have to redirect, rule of three, do all kinds of things to realign because our mind has already started to, I don't want to fucking, I don't want to call the credit card company again. I said that one for a reason. Shane is over there laughing, but yes. All right. Does all of that make sense? So if I, I'm ever talking about connection and the less we talk or think about it, the Tao Te Ching, the moment you label it beautiful, you have also created ugliness because that's a concept. But you can still immerse yourself in that beauty without ever creating its contextual opposite because you're feeling, you're immersed in it. So there's a lot of quality that can come from connection, maybe even the word love, however we want to look at that word. Does that make sense? Makes sense. Any questions about the nature of connection? I could I could do a whole webinar on the nature of connection, and it would be fun <laughs> for me. I think anyway. um, there are other members who aren't here that are looking forward to that on Thursday. I know, um, yeah. 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 And so I'll talk about that more on Thursday, but uh, I'll post this recording so that we have a working definition uh, that we, and now we could talk about it. So now you guys know, you know, if you want to talk about the nature of connection, or the derivative 
of connection post-processing. Now we can talk about that because it makes sense now. What's really interesting is the capstone of this practice is you're making a connection to, to everything, but you're doing it as a point of active attention, not as a point of conceptual nonsense that you tell yourself, pretentious shit that you tell people so that they'll they'll find you more intellectually attractive. We're all one, man, in my best hipster voice. All right, so let's get into the enemies of knowledge. So can anybody tell me what are the three parts of knowledge? As I use the word, again, I don't, I've never heard this anywhere else. Um, data, information, uh, data information. or information, mm -hmm. um, experience of self, and experience of others. Yes, and some would say that the purpose of humanity is to increase one could argue that it would be the goal in some part of any intelligent species as it continues to evolve, uh, whether you're passing knowledge through DNA uh, in in the way of like instinct with other animals, or you're passing information on the way that we do it with books and stories and um, things like that. That's so you're considering innate... Um, uh... I don't know, innate things that you come into the world with as experience of self that would fall into that category. I think it could, yeah. Because you don't really, it's, you know, that, that whole concept of a blank slate. I don't, you I know, you come it. in with DNA, you come in with some level of, of um, ability to, to yeah. perceive. So that's, um, you know, you didn't, I don't know. I don't know. That could be a whole other discussion too. But you're con you're considering that mm -hmm. you're you're putting that in the category of experience of self. I am, yeah, okay. and or at least information, a form of information that is being passed through biological means as opposed to uh, like written material. So anything that's passed in your DNA, it's information. Isn't DNA information? It's a record. It's a storage of information, and it gets passed. And so that's a way of, of looking at it. Mm -hmm. Maybe not experience per se. Maybe I put that on the island of possibility that we can access experience through a form of memory that we don't understand. I'll put that on well, the island of possibility. Development, growth in the womb, we're accessing mm -hmm. DNA, which is experience of self in a way. In a so, way, yeah. sure. We could look at it that way. Um, but... You can't say that we're a blank slate and then simultaneously say that somebody has a predisposition towards alcoholism. You see what I mean? Then they're not a blank slate. They're a slate that has a predisposition towards alcoholism. There's a whole debate about all of that. But yeah. yeah, that, you know, you're in an environment, you grow in the body of someone and you're immediately in the environment of someone who um, you're immersed in a um a set of data that predisposes you. So there's, mm -hmm. you know, where where is it in the DNA and where is it in the environment is always a debate. Yeah, it's super small. So it's it's definitely something to debate for sure, if you're interested. Okay, so uh, where was I going with that? What were we talking about? Three um, aspects of knowledge. Okay, yeah, and... Well, that's important because we have to know what knowledge is before we can identify enemies of it. And give me just one second. I'm just going to blow my nose real quick.
Okay. All right, so we have a working definition of knowledge. I'll put that on the whiteboard. Does anybody have a, any questions or comments about our working definition of knowledge? That it has three parts primary, primarily. Knowledge is subject to the balance principle. So we want ideally to have a balance between these, these elements of knowledge. I'll put data since uh, Donna mentioned data. I normally just say info, but data is fine. Uh, shared EXP or the stories of others. It was a, a very ancient technique for human beings to share the stories of their culture and of their their individual societies and groups, because that's for a long time before writing was made popular. That was the primary way of sharing knowledge was through stories. So does anybody have any questions about this, this definition of knowledge? Information by itself is a part of knowledge. Personal experience by itself is a part of knowledge. But you have to be, if you want to share it, if you want to give it to somebody else, you, you have to find a way to do that. If it's just personal experience, you have to find a way to transmit that. And that's usually through stories, through words, uh, things like that. You could even do like plays, movies nowadays would qualify. So does anybody have any questions about the def the working definition of knowledge? So we'll take what we were talking about before with the connection point, the action point, and we'll talk about learning. So when we learn, we are adding to our information, right? Or we're adding to our personal experience, or I'm listening to somebody and I'm gaining their experience to a certain extent because they're sharing it with me. Does that make sense? Now we have an action point and we have a post-processing point. The action point, of course, is the present moment as it's occurring. Or we can do a post-processing point and read a book. Even that's happening now, though. But it could be about something that happened before. So ideally, the best way to learn is to learn directly from the moment as it happens. Because if you rely on memory, that's post-processing. How, how can you rely on your memory 100%? You might not remember aspects of the event that are very important to the overall knowledge. Does that make sense? So what I'm pointing out is that learning happens in the moment and you increase the potential for learning by being immersed and perennially aware of the present moment. That's where the lessons are occurring. And I'm not saying that your whole life is this long test and that the universe is testing you and that the divine is 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 creating obstacles for you or whatever, N nothing like that. But there's always something to learn because we have this thing called personal experience. It's an ongoing thing. It's a running film of personal experience. So we're exposed to a lot of information but we have to also pay attention to personal experience to add that to our, our bank of knowledge. And the best way to learn from the moment is by paying attention and being immersed in the moment. One of the best examples of that is all of our acronyms are only possible with active attention on the present moment. This is where knowledge comes from. If you want knowledge, you have to have sensory attention training. Cognitive attention training, emotional attention training, behavioral attention training. Sat cat eat bat. That sounds silly. So nobody has to memorize that. But in order to learn from the present moment, you have to pay attention to it. That involves your sensory data. If you want to follow the, the number one thing that we're supposed to do as human beings, and that's know yourself, that's those acronyms again. You're knowing yourself by knowing where your mind is, where your emotional state is, what your behavior is, the things that you're doing. That's knowing yourself in the moment. That's knowledge. And there's a lot of power behind that. Uh, a lot of people say that information is power, and it's just not. It can, it can, you know, be levied and, and used 
uh, to a certain extent, but it's it's not power how I would use the word. Hey, Mike, did you have a comment? I see that you're unmuted. I didn't know if it's um, an intentional act. No? Okay. Any questions about any of this? We have an action point. That's where we want to, to put our mind. That's where learning occurs. If you're learning in a classroom, you're in that classroom. You're either there, you're paying attention, you're taking information in as a part of your experience, or you're off thinking about some other shit, in which case you're not really taking in any, you're not really learning at all. So we can see this dynamic empirically. We can even probably study it uh, scientifically as well. We could create some experiments where people are paying attention and where people aren't paying attention. The people paying attention will process more information than the people who aren't. It's pretty, pretty basic. We shouldn't need uh, science, the scientific method to prove that. But we can. Okay. So with all of this in mind, what do you think is the first enemy of knowledge? What is the first thing that will interrupt? this process of paying attention to the moment, <clears throat> taking in the information, sensory information, our emotional information, all of these different acronyms. What What is the number one thing that would prevent this process from occurring smoothly? Distraction. Usually by thought. Usually yep. by thought, Distraction. Distraction. Usually by thought streams. Distraction. Absolutely. Yep. And this is what the world looks like to me. It's it's very difficult for me, and I, I it's it's difficult for me to frame this in a way um, that is anything other than the than the way I see it. And the world is highly distracted now. The way that people will use this word in the world, it's usually conspiracy theory stuff. Don't be distracted by mainstream media. Here's the truth. So that's just replacing thought. That's not what I'm talking about at all. Thought interrupts our ability to process the present moment and learn from it directly we want to learn from the moment directly does that does anybody well, yes i think that the the thought that's most commonly occurring in the and commonly as as a distraction is just habitual repetitive thought Absolutely. it's the same people just keep doing the same yes. thing they keep there's not it's not new thought that's distracting you that would be hopeful and interesting um it's not new thought it's it's um regurgitated habitual beliefs and thought streams yeah right yep uh and then ultimately you can narrow it down to that thought is they're just thinking about themselves or they're thinking about others in relation to themselves right that's why there's all polarization we have to pick a side Right. You know, throw out a topic and I mean, that's a common thing on Facebook now. It's Very just, uh, you know, sugar in your spaghetti sauce. Everybody go like, let's fight about it. You know, <laughs> pick a side and let's argue about it because you have to be on one side or the other. And, and that's a based on total habitual repetitive. It this is. is the way we do it because. Yeah. And there's really not a lot of because because it's the way we've always done it. And it's the right way. Right. Yep. So we'll list these. The easiest one to talk about with the enemies of knowledge is distraction. And I mean uh, distraction from the moment at hand. You know, this makes so much more sense. It always made sense, but it makes so much more sense because you started with the definition of connection. And you okay. can see in all of these instances how that connection in the way that um, we have a shared definition now is lost once these things start happening, how it it, de it decays, the quality mm -hmm. of the moment decays immediately. Immediately. Yep. Now, I would say the quality of the moment decays immediately with thought that isn't deliberate. Voice of power can move things in another direction, but ultimately, um, all thought is a form of interference. So, and some interference is okay to a certain extent. You know, we're very um, dynamic creatures. So, a little bit of interference isn't going to end our world. So, we can we can deal with a little bit and then counterbalance. That's fine. 
Okay, so the first one is the easiest. Um, and I'm sure that you can imagine, based on some of our other discussions, where the destroyers will fit in. What are people distracting themselves about? The destroyers. They're distracting themselves about the destroyers. Um, we're looking at our cell phones all the time because the brain is bored or otherwise at odds with the present moment and it requires entertainment. Biology. The reason that they're looking at their phone, the reason that they're doing 90% of the things that they're doing is because they're participating unknowingly in a very complex human mating ritual. Society. And that's a big reason that people are doing what they're doing. Common cognition is a direct reflection of the society at that time. And to some extent, that's just a dynamic. It's okay, but obviously in the human dynamic, currently it is way out of balance and it becomes a destroyer. Society becomes the destroyer because of the mind being below the threshold of active recognition or the nemesis. All right, so the second one should seem obvious. What is less obvious, though, is where this comes from. Obviously, one of the enemies of knowledge is ignorance. And ignorance is lacking knowledge. You don't have information, personal experience, or shared experience. Um, so if you've never read a book in your life, you've never seen a book, you are ignorant to books. And sometimes ignorant, of course, is used as a derogatory term. I'm using it to its, its truer definition, which would imply every single person here is ignorant of something. Does that make sense? Now, more correctly to Igong, the way that I'm using the word is ignorance comes from not paying attention to the moment. We become ignorant to the moment itself. We're not interacting with it. We're not doing anything with it. We're not accumulating knowledge from it. So we are immersed in ignorance when we are distracted. So these will start to kind of link together. Because you're layering your own past perceptions, thoughts, and opinions right over the present moment. So there's nothing new there. Is that what you mean? There's, no, there's, there's nothing new there. Yeah. Um, and then when you're not paying attention to the moment at all, you're not, we're, we're really just not learning. We're just doing it. We're just acting out things, but we're not really learning as we go. Now, you could argue to a certain extent <clears throat> that the body and the mind are always processing. Um, it's a very minimal form of learning. That would be muscle memory, you know, a little bit of uh, working memory, that type of stuff, because it's below the threshold of active recognition. Does that make sense? Can you say that again, that last sentence? What's well, what's below the level of active recognition? Attention. Are you thinking? Oh, oh your attention. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. When attention is be <clears throat> below the threshold of active recognition, you may still be processing your environment, of course, but you're not doing it deliberately. So you're not really adding to your knowledge bank. You mean like when you drive home and you pull into the driveway and you don't exactly. remember the trip? You don't remember the trip. Yeah. Now, if you were doing it as an act of awareness, you would have learned a lot, very likely, from that trip. You would have learned about yourself. You would have learned about other people. You, you would have learned about your car. You would have learned about the you know the the smoothness of the streets or not if if they're bumpy. You would learn all kinds of things because you'd be adding to your, uh, you'd be, you could be adding to your information bank. That's a way, but you'd really be adding to your experience bank. And if you can learn how to listen, then you can really listen from other people. And active listening is almost required to learn from other people and their stories. Otherwise, you just memorize them. You didn't really learn from it. Does that make sense? It does. I can tell by. I can tell when I'm doing that, when I'm coasting and when I'm actively listening or not by the fact that I have no questions. You know, mm -hmm. if I'm just waiting for somebody to stop talking to have something to say, then I'm not active listening because I usually have questions. Yeah. I want clarification on what they mean um, when I'm active listening. Mm -hmm. And I am organizing a way to do that uh, within the practice, active listening through a little checklist. Um, and technique. 
one technique I love it, but is basically superimposing words running across the screen of my mind as a person talks. I'm closed captioning them. To do that, I really hear their words, though. Like, I hear everything they say in order to do that. And I remember more of what they say. I connect more to what they're saying. Connect? Why did I connect? Because I'm paying attention. To the moment. To the moment. And in the moment, I'm listening and really hearing what they're saying. I'm processing it better with less interference. That's the key. Non-interference. So ignorance is a form of an enemy of knowledge. Seems like an obvious one, but what is less obvious is ignorant to what? Ignorant to the moment itself. When the mind is below the threshold of active recognition, the mind is swimming in its own ignorance. Ignorance of the world around, ignorance of the world inside. If we're not aware of our body and space and time, we're ignorant to our own existence. Meanwhile, we're taking one tiny aspect of ourselves, maybe it's a job, maybe it's somebody liking you or not liking you, maybe you have this goal in your mind that you're just going over all the time and it's really important to you at the moment. That's what the human being does, is they take these infinite aspects of ourselves and they focus in narrowly on just one through thought, trying to control. That should sound pretty familiar as well. I can talk about it so well because it was familiar to me also. I am just, I, I don't know where it comes from. Somebody asked me that before, but um, my ability to pay attention to the human experience and organize it, I don't know where that shit comes from, but it, it's it's happening very easily for me the more that I do my practice. And so very likely I can only assume it will occur for everyone else as well. Okay, are you following along so far? Because it's about to get dicey. Now, this is, a, this is a dynamic that you can see in the world. So we can see this with other people in society, and we can see it in, in other ways. What normally happens is that a person will have disproportionate aspects of knowledge meaning they'll have a whole lot of information and not a lot of personal experience, and they're not very good at listening to people, so they don't really take others into account. So they're missing two aspects of knowledge. That's very imbalanced. Does that make sense? Uh, we've talked about that before, toxic knowledge. When you're just accumulating so much knowledge and you can't even remember it all or process it, if you can't process it and remember it, you can't express it unto wisdom. And that's the real goal of knowledge is to be able to remember and express it. Again, that's how I use the word wisdom is the expression of knowledge. Well, it's more difficult to express if you're not present, if you're not moving with the moment, if you're not adapting and going with change. It's much more difficult to remember and express if you're lost in emotional turmoil, if you're just re responding to things in habitual patterns. So the third is the perception of knowledge, which you could put in parentheses, arrogance. So I'm going to put in number three, the imbalance of knowledge. And it will look, it's not arrogance necessarily, that's just a word to describe, well, what does that look like in the world? They really think they know some shit. Dunnage, Dunnage, I'm misspelling it, but Kroger, I'll put D Kroger, Dunnage Kroger effect is when a person is overconfident. <laughs> So the imbalance of knowledge comes when there is an imbalance in those three elements in some way, usually in the information area. So knowledge itself can become an enemy of knowledge because it's imbalanced. And if it's imbalanced, it will lead to some sort of psychological suffering. 
suffering is the principle. I don't always know how because I'm not a fortune teller. But if you're completely relying on information, you're going to fall short. Does that make sense? It makes sense. You can learn, you can be an engineer and learn everything about a car. You could maybe assemble it, t disassemble it and assemble it, but it doesn't mean you can drive it until sure. you drive it. Um, yes. And without offending anyone, um, I think of um, a priest uh, giving marriage counseling. Um, I always found that to be amazing. Uh, why would you go to a priest for marriage counseling? Because he's taken a vow of celibacy and he's never been married and uh, he doesn't have those kinds of relationships. So he might think he has a whole lot of information about what marriage is supposed to be, but he's never lived it or had anything close to it. So why would I go to him for exactly. that information? Exactly. I see it a lot with this practice. And I've seen it a lot over the years where people have an information understanding of this practice, but they don't do it. So they can talk about the destroyers. They can talk about the three pillars or whatever aspect of Egong we're talking about. But in terms of sharing experience, it's not there because they're not really doing it. They could argue against it. I have my own um, responsibility for that. I could be the devil's advocate for everything you're trying to teach, but it eventually I have to say, shut up and do it. And then, and then have the conversation because your, your conversation means nothing until you're actually practicing or attempting to practice. And then you can yeah. talk about uh, being the devil's advocate because you have some some experiential knowledge behind you. There you go. Yep. All right. So any questions about how it gets really dicey at the end? The second to the last one is the trickiest of them all. But so we have six and we're on number four. An enemy of knowledge. Uh, what? Why is it? Because we stop learning. We're not really paying attention. We're not really growing. We just think we are <laughs> because information is so robust. Uh, it's more rare that a person would have so much personal experience, but they never use language to talk about it, but then they can't share it. It's not really knowledge. Knowledge is something that can be shared. That's one of the characteristics of knowledge is that it can be shared. Or expressed, which or, is a form of which sharing. Which is wisdom, which is, yeah, which is a form of sharing. Sure. All right. So this one we see a lot in the world. Uh, we see it every single day to some extent, but the fourth enemy of knowledge. And you, if you experience these, you, you know, like Donna just said, it's much easier to understand them or why they're there. Personal power. And in parentheses, I'll put the untempered spirit. So somebody who's not practicing Igong can still access the dynamic of personal power, right? Which is intention and will. Intention and will, because it's being led by desire, I'm, that's automatic, but that triangle exists. The desire, the intention, and the will. The other triangle that I superimpose over it with intelligence, that doesn't exist, not necessarily. So in this dynamic, you have somebody, say, a, a certain ex-president, say, a certain billionaire that loves spaceships. You have people who have a lot of personal power in one area, but their spirit is untempered, and it equals a lot of suffering for themselves and other people. And they stop learning. They stop learning because they're not paying attention. They think they got this. They're, they're feeling themselves in a manner of speaking. And I have experienced this directly. It is a it is a gross imbalance, yes. And they are feeling personal power, though. So they're accessing something that you and I are also accessing through this practice, but it's an untempered spirit, meaning that attention is a kite that is below the threshold of active recognition, and it's likely being held by the financial destroyer, which isn't one of them, but you know what I mean. Does that make sense? Any questions about that one? I, I thought that that one would be a little bit trickier. No, it's not trickier and trickier, but it certainly 
follows. And then you can see that the following is of, of someone who is in gross imbalance is usually followed by others with gross imbalances. Sure. And so there's a there's a belief or trust that this um, person or figure or leader or whatever ha must have must be um, uh, worthy of following because of the the evidence of their personal powers. They don't see the imbalance um, because of their own. Right. Yep. All right. So this is easy peasy. So number five is the hardest, and number six is one that we we you, you can't beat it. So you have to join it. Um, but number five is the biggest one. It is one of the biggest drivers of the human experience. It is the way the it's the reason the world is the way it is. In traditional Chinese medicine, it is the emotion of all emotions that drive all other untempered and unbeneficial and undesired emotions. What do you think it is? And it is an enemy of knowledge. It's the biggest enemy, one of the biggest enemies of knowledge. It's number five. All right. Nobody wants to guess. Can you put the whiteboard up, please? Yes. You see it? All right. So no guesses. Fear. Fear drives so much in the human experience. And it is one of the underlining things that will cause a person to stop learning, to stop growing, because they're afraid of everything. They're afraid of the future. They're afraid of what will happen if this and this and this and this. There's a lot of fear involved. Anger, you can trace it back to fear. Jealousy, hate, envy, wrath, all of these emotions that get very extreme, you can trace them all back in some way. Jealousy, you're afraid that they're going to like someone else more. Uh, you're afraid that you're going to lose the person. You're afraid that you're not going to get something done. You're afraid that you're not going to fit in. Your social anxiety, you're afraid that people aren't going to accept you or like you or view you the way that you want to be viewed or uh, the way that a person views themselves. So the number one thing that is driving the human condition one of the number one things how is that how is that one thing being expressed donna but but through thought couldn't That's fear be couldn't fear be number one and then everything uh, else that you wrote be a b c d it and could e it could that? it could but it, doesn't it doesn't that isn't that where a lot of it comes from it does absolutely it does um Remember that fear can be a natural thing. It can be a healthy thing. If there's a tiger in the room, you do want that fight or flight response. If there's no tiger in the room, then you do want to breathe it out and get to the to the relaxation response. Yes, and it could, but it's also one of the strongest. So I don't list it first. I kind of, I guess I, my list is listed in a way that will kind of warm somebody up to it. <laughs> you know. Before there's, we, fear behind, there's fear there's some element of fear behind all of those other things right? maybe to a, maybe to a certain extent distraction doesn't necessarily have to be out of fear that could just be out of the momentum of habit um ignorance itself doesn't necessarily have to be born out of fear it just means that you're not paying attention uh as per the beginning of of the class no connection is really occurring right so um knowledge arrogance personal power um, I think that you could find fear rooted in those, but I'm not sure I could always find a direct causal link. And and they're not listed that way. Does that make sense or not? They're they're just listed because the last two and and also uh, personal power, knowledge, they start to get a little bit more dicey in terms of how easy it is to understand. But that that's why when I look at traditional Chinese medicine. All of the other emotions are all a derivative of fear. So being able to, um, in some ways, eliminate unnecessary or undue fear will cause the system to rebalance. 
your organs and your your chi, your meridians. Um, it will cause all of that to rebalance because the fear factor isn't there as much. Now, what the human being is creating is fear outside of a, of a psychological response or a, a response from the present moment. There's no tiger in the room, and it's usually being expressed through thought. Thought is what is driving these fears. Does that make sense, Donna, or the group? It made perfect sense. I'm just thinking that all all forms of um, uh, anything other than feeling content with the moment um, is a form of fear. Anxiety is a form Trace of it. fear. <laughs> and, and so a lot of all those other distractors, you know, why do we over emphasize knowledge in terms of data because maybe we're good at data and we have a belief system that the data what is more important or but but um all those imbalances to me um I don't know, then you're not acknowledging some if if you can't feel the imbalance then there's a reason why you're i mean i like to do what i what i'm good at I don't like to do what I'm not good at. That's been a tendency for me my whole life. And mm -hmm. why is that? I don't like to do what I'm not good at it because I'm afraid to be embarrassed or I don't want to feel unsuccessful at something. I, I want to, you know, it, it, it's a form of fear. It is. You know, if I, if I back down everything, if I break down everything to its simple, simplest form, it's fear. I've, you know, I'm invited to a party. I'm all excited to go to the party. I have a great time at a party. I'm a party girl, but there is an element before I leave where I'm trying to talk myself into not going and why it's going to be stupid and what am I going to wear? And it's all my own insecurities that rise just before I'm about to leave. It's all fear. It's all fear. Like I can trace everything back to fear. You can either directly or indirectly. It can get tricky, though, because you'd have to like follow the person around and find out where their fear is leading their distraction. But this is also... Yeah, I understand in the basic explanation. I do understand what you're saying. But fear, the word itself sometimes is one of those things like love that gets... Um, it, it, well, it, it, people think uh, a tiger in the room. Yeah, sometimes my heart is beating and I'm like, what the heck? I'm so upset about this yeah. social interaction and there's no tiger in the room, but my body is having the response as if there is. So it, it helps me to mitigate that whole thing. But it's not always at that high level, you yeah. know, and so it can be insidious. You don't recognize it, as, you know, when it's just simple, casual anxiety over something. Um, it's still fear. It is. No, I can't. There's, I have no defense for any of that. But what I would say, though, is that these are listed in the what is easiest to address. So number one, the easiest thing to address is our distraction. So once we've addressed our distraction, then we actually start to learn from the present moment. And then we have addressed our ignorance. Once we're learning from the present moment, once we've made a connection to the present moment, made an, a more authentic connection to other people, then we're less likely to uh, feel that arrogant energy or the personal power, um, untempered spirit type of energy. So the fear one is going to be the most difficult to address though, because I it's, see, it's I so see it. I understand now why you listed it the way you do. That makes perfect sense. And especially why the last one is listed last. <laughs> and they go together because like you said, it's it's impossible to separate fear from the way that people are behaving. Um, and six is, well, what are we afraid of? Death. Or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> the physical body's transition to something completely unrecognizable. Uh, what happens energetically after that's not what I'm talking about. Um, it's even the unknown of death. Because if somebody feels like they don't know what's going to happen, then... Well, quite frankly, they're more likely to make up stories or, um, yeah, find something that suits them to mitigate the fear of death. But death is an enemy of knowledge because obviously, when you die, you don't learn anymore, and it's an enemy that we could become comfortable with. When the more we become comfortable with it, the more that we use it as our advisor the less it is an enemy of knowledge. But 
when we're afraid of our death, when we're being driven by the fear factor or trying to control those factors, we cut ourselves off from learning. It's more difficult to learn from the present moment when all of our behavior, the way that we're acting, is just out of a fear of death. And then it gets to the certain point where the human mind starts to push it to the back, to where everything is being driven by the fear of death, but we're no longer just thinking about our death. And then we're not using death as our advisor and all kinds of turmoil can accumulate. But if we really want to learn from the present moment, we can't be in an energetic state of constant fear and we can't be afraid specifically. We can't push it off. We can't pretend it doesn't exist. Again, balance. I'm not also recommending thinking about our impending transition all the time. Thinking isn't what I'm talking about. So that's why I list that one last. It is the one that you know, you can be 109 years old and you're still, you know, coming to terms, still learning to navigate and negotiate that particular enemy of knowledge. Does that make sense? Yes. So the the trick with death is to use death as your advisor. And that is a technique that I offer very early on. And it is what will create the baseline of the pyramid which is the baseline of appreciation, the appreciation of life itself. So I gave you guys the Qigong or the Igong checklist. I have my own checklist and it looks like a pyramid of hydrostasy. And each layer of the pyramid leads to what I call the capstone, which is the definition of connection. And it's pristine connection, connection without interference. And that's what I call the capstone of this practice. Uh, the techniques that I immerse myself in the most, and I'll be doing it until I'm 110 years old. But it's without the element of fear. It's without the element of uh, fear of death, because death has become the advisor. Does that make sense? Yes. And so these are the enemies of knowledge. Very succinct, very easy to see. Um, to the largest extent, you can see it in your environment. If, again, you're paying attention to the world around you, you can see how things are moving and you can't help but notice. Uh, going from I can't help but notice to thought streams is a completely different thing because the thought stream can start to include opinion, which is a form of judgment. And then, of course, then that's cutting you off from attention being placed in the moment, which is where all connection occurs. So any questions about the enemies of knowledge? As you go through this practice, you'll see these enemies at least at some point. And maybe you won't. You know, maybe uh, personal power will never become an enemy because how pristine your practice is. But we've seen how personal power can easily become an enemy for for society. You know, maybe Lauren is practicing or I don't want to use Lauren. Maybe somebody is practicing this practice and uh, they realize that this is the law of attraction. It does connect. And, you know, they start to do things a little bit willy nilly. And then before you know it, they're on a high flying disc and they have, you know, luxury cars and luxury yachts. But where is their mind? And did they put it there? They don't fucking know. So they've cut themselves off to knowledge and it has led to uh, the enemies of knowledge, which will facilitate the five destroyers. And what is the one solution? I figured Donna would get this one, but what is the one solution to all of this? There's only one. Present moment, your attention. It's the mind being above the threshold of active recognition, because yep. active recognition is the human element. It's the thing that launched our ability to perceive, our ability to, um, you know, be the way that we are with our mind, with our body, with our energy is self-awareness, self-recognition. And this it was the definition of attention and connection that you made in the beginning of class 
maintained throughout exactly. the day. Right. Uh, yeah, that's a good way to look at it. The Egong basic alignment is establishing connection. How do we make that connection in the first place? I would say that counterbalance and warrior training are about maintaining that connection. Hydrostasy is what do we do with that connection once it's been realized and has, excuse me, started to gain momentum. I don't know if we've specifically discussed connection from the beginning, but how it relates to attention um, is, uh, I don't know, I have a, a broader understanding of it right now, and it could just be where I'm able to hear it differently as a result of my practice, or whether we discussed it in the beginning, I don't, I can't recall, but sure I, um, it's, you know, when you say you, you, um, in the morning, you establish your practice by, you know, you start from basic alignment and build the pyramid from there every day. Every day. Um, and, and sometimes during moments of the day as well, when you are feeling it start to, to fall apart or not be as pristine, um, you, you remind yourself with that checklist, but the the relationship between connection, attention, and existing above the le threshold of recognition is is so intrinsically tied to each other. Um, I I have a new understanding of that right now. Yeah, and then ultimately, when we talk about knowledge and learning, it's these acronyms. What are we What are we really learning? You know, what, what is the moment offering us that we can learn from it? The only way to access what the moment is offering is through these acronyms. One way or another, whether it's a completely different system and, you know, they're still leading you to the same place, there will be sensory attention, cognitive attention, emotional attention, behavioral attention. So that is know thyself that is self-awareness and before right, you know it we're, we're you know, all doing it we're all using all of those acronyms all the time the key is is it above or below the threshold of recognition when we're doing it true yeah you can be swept in an emotion but you haven't created the separation uh with the self-recognition and it's a it's a it's one of those fun things of duality is that by creating the separation by the recognition of self, you can more likely create a wholeness as well. So the human existence, the human being has many aspects, and I call that the self. Likes, dislikes, memories, hopes, dreams, aspirations, emotions, situations that they've been in, knowledge to some extent is a part of the human experience. What the human does is because of fear, they end up focusing on one narrow aspect of their human experience. And it's usually thoughts about themselves in one way or another. Uh, what's going right for me? What's going wrong for me? What do I want? What do I want to see? What do I want other people to do? One of the biggest ones in like the law of attraction community and spiritual communities is what do I want to feel? And I know, I'm not sure I've ever said it this way before, but freedom is in the ability to feel high-flying disc or not feel high-flying disc and still feel free. Does that make sense? It makes sense. Um, there's a, a one, but yeah. There's a lesson. Um, it was actually I, um, my sister-in-law is friends with the woman who they did this practice with middle school children and high school children. And it became popular in public schools. It's called Project Adventure. And they created these, um, uh, like a playground for, for bigger kids on the on school property. And there were rope ladders to climb or, or um, but it wasn't arduous. It was um, walk across a, a beam high, high up in the air, um, things like that. And the purpose, and it wasn't athletes that ran the practice. It was uh, it was an effort to teach how we use our minds, what, what you're talking about now, and and how fear is such a um, a destroyer. I don't think they used out the words that we use in class here that you use, but um, this, the the lesson is the same. And they'd put these kids through this obstacle course, for lack of a better word. But it was all. I mean, if you were reasonably able-bodied you could do it and and there were mechanisms to keep you safe 
but you were high up. And so you had this fear of walking across a beam that was wide enough to walk across. You didn't need any special skills to do it, but it, it introduced this whole concept to the students that um, once you could overcome your fear about something you, and you focus on the task at hand, it, you're walking just like you would walk on the ground. The only element that's making it so arduous for you is your opinions about it, your safety, your fear of, um, and we've eliminated you know, the fact that you could get hurt um, and you still are having a hard time with it. So it was about perspective. It was about threshold of recognition. It was about the power of fear. It's all of those things in those lessons. Um, it, it just made me think of that while you were discussing it. It's really hard for us to, to disseminate and, and take that apart when um, that's why it's dicey because we don't even recognize we're so uh, often below the, the threshold of recognition and we have so much habit and momentum going with all of those things it's it's hard to dissect unless you're actually doing the, the practice every day yeah that makes sense to me um but, but these are the enemies of knowledge and the enemies of knowledge are directly related to the destroyers uh, because there's a lot of fear in the destroyers of course People fear death, so they don't want to look at it. They don't want to make friends with it. Um, and then, you know, like Donna was just mentioning how, <clears throat> you know, how we interact with fear on a, a, a physical level. But as you can imagine with this system, we're not looking to eliminate fear. We're looking to find balance. So if there is a tiger in the room, let's go ahead and have a fight or flight response. And I'm going to jump out the freaking window and I'll be okay. Right. So that's an appropriate type of, of fear to a certain extent. But what we what humans have gotten themselves into is these enemies of knowledge and these destroyers are driving fear factors and latent fear factors, like very sometimes difficult to trace the the link to the, the fear factor, but it's there. Does that make sense? It does. And and um traditional talk therapy takes us trying to relive every moment of our lives so we can we can trace back where the fear comes from and then look at it and then it, that in itself doesn't dissolve it as a matter of fact it, as a matter of fact it might exacerbate it there is value i'm not saying there's no value but it's was it's not an efficient way of going about it if you practice this practice and you're mindful then those things come to the forefront as a i can't help but notice that because in the absence of the practice of the way that we exist, um, and when we choose to exist above the threshold of recognition, then those um, things that pull us out of it, the enemies, become more apparent on their own. Yes. They dissolve. Um, you can see them dissolve, or you can see them come up, and you go, oh, look at that. It's here's something interfering with what I'm trying to practice. So it wasn't a digging up the past kind of thing that you had to do. It was just existing, in, um, operating above the threshold of recognition mm -hmm. um, deliberately that caused it to be noticeable. Right. So with that in mind, the uh, capstone of the practice is embracing the most important aspect of the human condition, the two aspects that I view as the, as the human condition, the two most important aspects. And this is kind of one of the first times I've ever drawn the capstone before out for you. Because this is split attention. And then um, imagine that this circle is like a halo though. And that's the second attention. This one is impeccable self-awareness. And I, I'm not, I don't mean this in a, uh, I mean this in the most literal feeling term because know thyself. We're all one man, but yet we focus, human beings in general focus attach and identify to individual aspects of themselves. We've seen this. This is how, and again, uh, 
balances the principle. So I have aspects to earnest, you know, the way that I dress, the way that I look, the my sexual preferences, my food preferences, my behavioral preferences, the things that I enjoy. So that's all a part of the earnest. But that's not the totality. The totality must also include the unknown and the unknowable. So human beings are going about their daily lives narrowly focused on one little slice of the self, the total self. Does that make sense? Which is why you can tell Gene Donna that the technique that Gene is doing of the third person view, that's almost a cheat. It's it's if if he continues to do that, he will find himself in hydrostasy faster than if he wouldn't have, in my opinion. That's an opinion. I don't know. So I would like to see it. But I'm in his house, so I'll go upstairs and tell him, him right after uh... that, that technique is a bridge, almost a direct bridge to hydrostasy, because what is it doing? It's creating a third person perspective where you can see more of the totality of self not just post-processing, but pre-processing as well, which is the direction of attention. All emotion, all feeling, I feel this, that is all post-processing. Attention arrives first. That's the connection point. Attention is directly related to connection. And attention in the capstone is you can see more of a peripheral view of yourself and that includes the present moment as a part of yourself. In relation to everything else. So that's why you can, when you're looking at it from the observer perspective, you can also say, well, that's on the island of the unknown. That's on the island of the possible. That's on the, because you're looking at it from a perspective that's not ego. Um, it's not from an ego perspective. It's from the observer of the ego. <laughs> so there are other things to observe outside of, there are other things. Yes. And I guess if ego are all of those aspects of the self that are like within the human unit, but I guess not ego, I don't normally talk about it this way because that's not really how I use the word ego. I don't really use the word ego like in a negative sense. It's more the to, the aspects of the human being. But when we start to view the earth, And when we expand our bubble of perception and we're viewing all of that as an aspect of the self, but guess what? I would view you as an aspect of the self, not myself necessarily, but the self. Does that make sense? And now we're all one man, but it's a form of active recognition, not a concept not a a cute meme that we agree with that we file into the back of our mind that we forget so that we can think about bullshit. Am I going to get the promotion? Is, is Joe blow going to agree with me and do what I want them to do? Are, you know, these human mating rituals going to come to fruition? Am I always going to feel good? I want to always feel good. That's a form of clinging and attachment. And it's a narrow focus of the self. Because you won't always feel good. The trick is to find this capstone even when you don't feel good because it's there. Sure. And then There's I, a whole bunch of things that exist outside of... Infinite. If I were there or not there, these things would still, you know, be there. So the there's a experience and life occurring, existence occurring outside of my perception of it. Yeah. Who knew, huh? <laughs> the universe doesn't revolve around us, even though it does. It's the opposites combined. So the abstract qualities. This is the reason I don't use the word love, because that word is is it's just it's used too much. It doesn't make any sense the way that people use it. They're just describing emotional derivative. Oftentimes they're just explaining or describing the emotional derivative from attachment through fear. And that's all just a bunch of of nonsense. I don't really, it's fine. I know what it, I know where it comes from. I don't need to declare war on it, but that's not how I use those words. So when attention is connected to the moment, to aspects of the moment, without interference, judgment, thought, labeling, comparing, contrasting, trying to figure it out, pity, these types of things, 
when that type of interference doesn't exist, then the quality of the moment through care and focus starts to come up. And I use the word qualities, qualities from the present moment that can be felt, but it's not necessarily good or bad, which is why I don't view it as emotional. I don't view either of these as emotional, by the way. This is pre-processing. So the abstract quality and impeccable self-awareness and impeccable self-awareness looks like awareness of these acronyms. Are you aware of your emotional state? Are you aware of the shit you're doing right now? What are your hands doing? What are your feet doing? What is your mind doing? Where is your attention? That's these acronyms. You either know thyself or you don't know thyself. It means you're paying attention to, to the more of the total self or below the threshold of active recognition. We're just focusing on aspects. These little individual things that when death is really starting to touch us, we won't give two shits about. You're not going to give two shits about whether this person is adoring you or not. You're not going to fucking care. So the abstract qualities of the moment are the most difficult thing to talk about directly because it's not an emotion. And it can exist even when negative emotions exist. My grandpa wrote a paper called Love in War. And I don't think any of us can identify in knowledge. We have no personal experience of what it's like to be in the trenches of Italy after an invasion with German soldiers literally 30 or 40 feet away. And he recognized the quality of the moment and he saw in air quotes, seeing, he could see a larger perspective where he thought maybe those soldiers didn't want to be there either. Maybe they miss their families just like he does. They're being put in a situation that they don't understand. And when the sun comes up, they're going to be forced to kill each other or try to kill each other. And that's the situation that they're in. But he found an underlining quality that's not good, that's not bad, that's not plus, that's not minus. It, emotional derivative hasn't occurred yet. Does that make sense? The emotional derivative, which is what most people will call love and connection and all of these different, it's just emotional output. It's an emotional soup that's created from the stimuli. I'm talking about the direct stimuli of the present moment and the underlining essence of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's where all the love is, by the way. Or connection without judgment, which is how I, can I define see how that. that can happen in a foxhole if you haven't been overcome by the fear of the moment. Right. Um, then uh, you have no other attention to put anything on. All of the bullshit attention is gone because you're in this uh, unique extreme circumstance. And so the purity quality of the connection of the moment is all there is left <laughs> in the absence of all um of the other uh, conditioned uh, below the threshold of recognition. Everything was above the level, the threshold of recognition for him in that moment. And he, and he wrote it down. Mm -hmm. And likely there was some physical exhaustion as well, which kind of breaks things down. Like we stop struggling sometimes so much because we're physically like dilapidated. Right. And then comes the capstone's final aspect. And with these two sustained, a third thing happens. And this is the end of the practice. And I have been calling it luminosity. Dalai Lama calls it the luminous effect or mere luminosity. Uh, Buddha had a word for it. Jesus had a word for it. Everybody throughout history has had some kind of word for this effect that occurs when you align with awareness itself, awareness itself, attention itself, perception itself, without interference, you become self-aware without interference. That's the key. And it feels like I'm drawing that picture. Um, it, it would feel like a halo behind the human being of energy and it's bright and it's magnetic and it's strong and it's uh, personal to one extent and shared to another extent. 
but it is something that you can place your attention on. And then before you know it, you have a view of the human experience that is almost purely from raw, uninterrupted attention and awareness. And remember that that attention and awareness is shared. So it is the divine or the God quality of the human experience is to exist in that shine and everything comes to life. And as you can imagine, there is absolutely no boredom there. There is no fear. There is no comparison. There is no trying to control, trying to manipulate, trying to achieve. Yet when you're in that shine, you're a creator still, but you're a creator that is connected and you are knowing yourself, the totality, not just narrowly focusing on one little aspect of ourselves in the present moment. And, and if, that's if, where we are all one man without the sarcasm. <laughs> boom. That's we're all one man without the sarcasm because you're feeling it. It's actualized. It's a part of the present moment. So if someone were to say, we're all one, you'd be like, yeah, I totally feel that right now. Like I feel this connection, not just to people, not just to places, not just to things, but the fabric of the cosmos because attention doesn't age. It doesn't get old. The voice in your head doesn't become an old voice. It's not a young voice. It's not an aged voice. It is the same for every single human being on earth. We share attention. We share that light. We don't. It and doesn't and that's called you. the second attention. Uh, you've called that the Bingo. second attention because you can have that while doing um, everything else. All the other acronyms exist. Absolutely. Yep. Bingo. And so this is the second attention. Whoops. And the second attention came from a term that I call split attention. And then I'll do this more on the last day. I'll draw the rest of this pyramid. The rest of this is the capstone of the pyramid. The rest of the pyramid is how I set up my practice throughout the day. And I'll just tell you the base of the pyramid is appreciation through death as my advisor. I'm addressing the enemies of knowledge also by doing that. And when you're in that luminous fear, psychological fear especially, doesn't exist. Not for you, not in the moment. Maybe habits, you know, neural pathways. That's why we counterbalance. That's why we adapt. But if you have all three of these active, if your second attention split attention, multiple points of attention, you are fucking supremely adaptable. You are more likely to change with change in the most energy efficient way, without clinging, without trying to control, without being afraid, without focusing on these little narrow aspects of ourselves, we get out there and we just do. Including transition. Including you, transition. Yeah, you, you can... Um... You can approach all of those things, including transition, yes. um, with that uh, smoothly. I think some of the ancient ways of looking at this is that we never defeat death, but you can learn to cooperate with it and use it as your advisor. It could become a friend rather than an enemy. And we're not afraid of our friends, even if they're dangerous. <laughs> Sliding into home base. Exactly. Yep. And then... And then you can also see why that kind of rounds out the practice as well. And I also have a pyramid that a person can fill in the blanks on their own. And that is called deliberate modulation. Sensing energy is more putting yourself using technique, especially the bubble of perception, expanding your bubble of perception, paying attention to the infinite detail of the present moment. That will put you in the position to sense energy. And building your pyramid will put you in the position to deliberately modulate. Having a complete pyramid will put you in the position to change with change or adapt, which is the sixth pillar, the act of allowing, the act of adaptation. And so the deliberate modulation, you kind of threw that in, the deliberate modulation in that building that you just said yes. is, the, is where the creation, you're still creating. Oh, yes. Of course. Yeah. yeah. We're creators. That's a, uh, when I outline and warrior training, the traps of thinking, I have also added the most beneficial types of thinking. We're creators. I mean, people look for universal. This is the way that I do it. 
personal purpose comes from universal purpose. The universal purpose is to create. I create writing. I create uh, igong. Uh, I'm going to create acupuncture. So I'll create the conditions for health and wellness. I'm doing that at Chen Chen. I'm doing that here with you guys. I'm doing that with Shana. I'm doing that in my, it's a, it's a fabric of my being now in a manner of speaking. And it's all conscious creation. It's all happening with intelligence overlining desire. They're not that far apart anymore for the most part. <laughs> I did have those three ice cream cones, but they were little ones. And that was intelligence a little bit further from desire. <laughs> but that's where adaptation and learning and constantly growing. And I'll be 110 and in this dynamic, yada, yada, yada. There is no perfection. There is just knowledge and learning and growing, expressing your knowledge unto wisdom. And then eventually acting with wisdom directly tied to intelligence. And intelligence is the fabric of of the cosmos. It's the reason that atoms coalesce. It's the reason there's movement. It's the reason we observe things as solid matter, because there is a, f an intelligent doesn't necessarily mean thought or concepts or definitions or words. Uh, so this idea that the universe has a plan, that's, how, that's what humans do. Again, the human being has made the universe in their likeness. Intelligence won't operate on our guidelines. Does that make sense? But Donna, the the base of the pyramid as it leads up to the capstone includes deliberate modulation and sensing energy. Absolutely. I can absolutely see as, as abstract as this may sound from one perspective, I can absolutely see everything you just did to sum up in basic alignment, yes. you know, because I'm still doing basic alignment. You are. It's a, when I open my eyes. <laughs> That's what's great about this practice is it layers. Yeah. So we're not we're not really in individual levels. We're all just in a layer of process. Freaking genius, freaking genius, Ernest. It works. <laughs> and then so when we talk about things like connection and then post-processing, I connect to pre-processing before I connect to post-processing. Although post-processing is important for me. I do like to feel good. I do like to uh, make loving connections with people and places and things and circumstances and all that exists, but I'm as not attached As long as it's in balance. It. As right. long as it's in balance. I'm not Otherwise attached Otherwise you're sensationalizing. It. Otherwise you're pulling you absolutely. away from the balance. And then before you know it, you are interacting with one of the enemies of knowledge and it's directly reflective of the five destroyers. Hi. It's all there. And that's how I talk about connection. That's how I talk about things like love and everything else. And um, the key, though, is pre-processing. Your attention arrives first before your interpretation of your environment, before your thoughts about your environment, before you're able to perceive the emotion your attention has arrived first. Attention is the key element of connection. It's the key element of everything. And I have absolutely no idea why it's not talked about. Nothing really that we look at discusses attention the way that I do. And I don't know why. I don't know how something so glaringly obvious <laughs> is so easily missed. It's a That's a big mystery to me. I have no idea. It, it it boggles my mind. Well, it's not it's not separated out of all the destroyers. It's just kind of when its attention is talked about, it has all of the destroyers included in it, yeah. and everybody includes the uh, different destroyers depending on their perception, and and then it gets watered down immediately. There's nowhere to go from there if you haven't if you haven't defined what attention is without the destroyers well attention is always just attention it's just where is it going is it feeding the destroyers below the threshold or are you 
I just meant in the common definition, attention oh. is spoken about, but it's not spoken about in this way. It's not oh, yeah. just in, in and of itself, what is attention? It's probably one of the words that's used the most often with no working definition. You can, people use the yes. word attention. You, said, but they that, have no you idea. said that much better than I did, but yes, that's what I meant. Yeah. They have no working definition of it. They couldn't, they couldn't give you a couple sentences to explain attention. Attention is the mind's ability to isolate aspects of available sensory data. Deliberately. Well, it doesn't have to be deliberately. Hopefully that's above the threshold of active recognition, but things can be in your attention and it's not deliberate. That's how you can drive to the grocery store without paying attention to the drive. Right. Yeah. So we all have attention and most people are just paying attention to their petty thoughts. No offense, but it's petty. Most of it's just petty. Labeling, judging, comparing, contrasting. It's extraneous. It's extraneous and not it necessary. Is. Yeah. It's uh, <clears throat> That's why I'll use the term, and I borrow this one from Don Juan, but it's injurious to the spirit. Indulging is injurious to the spirit. And most people are indulging in thought. And they're indulge, indulging in concepts rather than indulging in the present moment. But I don't, I wouldn't use that word, but. All right. Any questions, comments, concerns about any of this information? This is the enemies of knowledge. And I kind of connected that to what my practice looks like. So when I wake up, my first order of business is to check into appreciation using death as my advisor. I call these links almost in a chain of my practice because using death as my advisor leads to a type of appreciation that leads to a type of contentment. How can I have so much appreciation and then feel unfulfilled? Do you see, you see what I mean? So when the base is really there and you're not just talking shit and you really feel appreciation for attention itself, the moment itself, it leads to a type of contentment because it's enough. And then you're no longer bored or at odds with the moment. And then you start to walk through the gates of seeing before you know it, you're dream walking and you have no problems. Ask me, and I'm not trying to be, uh, actually, I'll stop the recording here, so.